Welcome back to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. My name is Jake Gray, and I'm the Youth and Education Manager here in Canton, Ohio, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the most inspiring place on earth. And we're excited to have our next installment of the Before the Snap series today featuring USA Today, NFL columnist, and Pro Football Hall of Fame selector, Mr. Jarrett Bell. And we'll get to him here in a minute. But if you're this is your first time tuning in today, first, we want to thank you for giving your time to learn a little bit about what takes place before the snap. And what that means is we're going to focus on all the different careers in and around the NFL that truly makes the game what it is. Not just the coach, not just the player, but all the people who are involved in the game to truly make it one of the greatest games to ever be played. If you've tuned in before, thank you so much again. You guys are in for another excellent program today with Mr. Bell. Um, the mission here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, to preserve its history, to promote its values, and to celebrate excellence everywhere. And those values we promote are those of commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. And not only do those values make our Hall of Famers great on the field, they made them even better men off the field. And those values just aren't in the sport of football. If you're a music player, if you're an artist, if you play basketball or baseball, or even if you're an award-winning columnist, these values play a huge role in everything that you do and truly make you better at whatever you like to do. Um, so I'm excited to kind of see how those values played a role in Mr. Bell's life, um, both in, in all the different career aspects he's had throughout his illustrious career in, in, in sports journalism. Before we turn things over first, Mr. Bell, I want to thank you so much for everything you've done for the game of football and everything you've done for us here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You know, the game of football isn't just a, a fall job that leads to the Super Bowl in February. It's a 365-day, all-year-round job and we thank you so much for everything not only have you done in your your writing side of things but everything you do for us as a selector here at the pro football hall of fame as well and to be honest you know i wouldn't really have a job if it wasn't for you electing hall of famers year in and year out so thank you so much for that um secondly i'd like to thank our teachers and administrators who are allowing us to be a part of your school day today we know this school year has been crazy and so much is going on you know remote learning is such a huge aspect of of school uh, nowadays. So we appreciate you allowing us to help with that and be a vehicle to, to teach students all about there is in careers in and around the NFL. And then lastly, I'd like to thank those students. You know, without you guys today, this program wouldn't be possible, whether you're a student in middle school, high school, college, or even a young professional like myself or a seasoned veteran uh, with a whole lot of experience like Mr. Bell. We thank you so much for tuning in. And if you are tuning in today and you have a question for Mr. Bell, feel free to put that in the comment section. You can put your name, the school you're from, the job you work, whatever it might be, put that information in there, throw a question up, and we'll try our best to make it a part of the program uh, throughout the, our next 45 minutes to an hour here. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest today, Mr. Jared Bell. Jared has covered professional football for USA Today Sports since 1993, almost as long as I've been alive, and has also <laughs> served as a contributor at ESPN from 2013 to 2017. Bell is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame Selection Committee and also helped select the Centennial team here at the Hall of Fame uh, when we did our Blue Ribbon panel a couple years ago. Upon graduating from Michigan State, he's covered sports in Texas, focused on the Dallas Cowboys, 49ers uh, in San Francisco, and then even the Baltimore Ravens. A, a native of Detroit, Michigan, he got his career in sports started young when he was with the Detroit Red Wings PR department. So that's enough for me. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our special guest today, Mr. Jared Bell. Mr. Bell, welcome to Before the Snap. Hey, how you doing, Jake? It's good to be here. Um, honored and uh, very delighted to be here and uh, would love to, to share whatever insight I can with, with our audience and the young kids always interested in trying to inspire and trying to enlighten and trying to get some of that back some of that energy back from the students as well 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 we're ready for it so our first question is and we we kind of do this every program to kind of kick off just can can you give everybody you know a ten thousand foot view of what your job currently consists of with usa today sports and some of the things you get to cover how you go about that uh and kind of you know your day-to-day -day life as a as an nfl columnist yeah you know it's interesting because the, the world has evolved, and, and by that I mean the media landscape and technology and how uh, news is distributed uh, is, is it's forever changing. But basically, I cover the NFL. I cover the entire league and with a national media operation, 
And that entails not only the games, but also the business around the games. And obviously this year, things have you know, really been dictated by the NFL's um, mission, desires to, to have a league and to have a, a schedule, to have a season amid a pandemic. So, you know, an enormous challenge for the NFL as it was for the NBA um, in, in coming back and as it was for Major League Baseball and as it is for so many businesses and schools and um, just other entities in life. So the NFL is, is just like so many other operations and in, 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 uh, you know, proceeding forward during this pandemic. Um, so we cover a lot. So I have to cover, I write, I write columns. I may end up writing four or five columns a week, depending on uh, what the news is of the week. That includes the game coverage, that includes uh, sometimes personality pieces, that includes uh, opinions on uh, situations that are, you know, going on in the sport and around the sport. And, you know, one of the cool things about this job and not even so much um, specific to the NFL, but I think just journalism in, in general is that it's almost like there are no two days alike. And I mean that even though I've been, <laughs> I've been a, a sports writer for a long time, for many decades, um, I can truly say that the things that I write about now, I've never written about before. And, um, and that's not just so much driven by talking about the pandemic, but just the, the nature of the beast, the nature of this of this industry and of this profession is that you're writing about different things. Now, some things are similar. Okay, the star quarterback got hurt. So you're writing about a guy who's injured and is a key player, what the ramifications are, so on and so forth. So yeah, that can be similar to something that I wrote 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but the, the, the people have changed, the names have changed, the circumstances have changed. Um, so one of the things that just really appeals to me about this industry is the fact that um, it is forever changing. Now, I also talked about at the top about how the industry has changed with technology. That's another thing because in, in the old days, when I first started, it was you write the story and the next day it came out in the newspaper. Well, now, of course, um, <laughs> most of the kids probably don't even touch a newspaper. Maybe their parents will touch a newspaper. Um, but uh, for the most part, everything is so immediate with the websites and the online and the digital platforms. And so uh, you still have to write a story. You still have the same standards in terms of uh, fairness and accuracy and things of that nature. But now, instead of the story not being published until the next day, it's published within a few minutes. And so, um, there are all sorts of creative um, things that come along with displaying stories and content on a website online that uh, has made it different as well. But it's still the nuts and bolts of it is who, what, when, and where, and what the story is. Um, so that is kind of what I do. <laughs> Uh, definitely a, a very interesting, as you can see, you know, with, with Mr. Bell's backdrop there, he's in a hotel room. So he's on the road, you know, you know, football hasn't stopped it and neither has, you know, the careers that go along with it. And I want to kind of jump into you there. You talked about technology and how it, it's ever changing and how it's truly changed your job from when you started. So somebody who's been in the business that long and has seen the transition from, you know, the pen and paper to the newspaper to online to now immediate stories when you're done with them. How have you as a, as a writer and as a journalist continued to better yourself and, and be able to utilize the technology that, that comes every day, it seems like, uh, here in the world that we live in? Yeah, it's a, Jake, it's a constant evolution, um, even to this day. And I, I think that's really good in a way that it kind of keeps you fresh, okay? People always kind of want to stay current and they want to stay in the mix with things. Well, you're almost forced to do that when you have to uh, present some type of content. So one of the ways that it's changed and 
in terms of um, the day to day with the job is that there's so much more video. So just like we're doing this video right now via Zoom, well, we do content with USA Today that is all video sometimes. And, you know, we have a team of video producers and that, you know, will edit and post and, and, you know, distribute video content. Whereas, you know, a generation ago, there was no such thing. You Maybe you would get interviewed by a television station or on a television station as part of a, a show. But now it's one of these things where you're doing it on your laptop, you're doing it on your iPhone and, and that sort of thing. The other thing that's different too is that, um, in, you know, content is pushed out on social media. So there are other, you know, avenues for, for getting the word out. And, and I mentioned that a few minutes ago, as opposed to the newspaper. And I saw a woman in the airport this morning looking for USA Today, and she was upset that they were sold out at the newsstand. So that was part of her habit. And she was a, a bit perturbed that she could not get the newspaper. And I, I wanted Jake so much to just thank her for saying, you're, <laughs> you're looking for our particular um, product. But um, a lot of people will get that content and get even more content by um, going to usatoday.com. And, and I can say that for, you know, just about any media outlet that has, you know, the, the print product and the website. And so that is really how it's changed so much. And, and again, the immediacy of things is, you know, what really stands out when I think about how, how things have changed so much. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about what's currently going on today and, you know, with the pandemic and how that has, you know, almost supersonically advanced all these different technologies and different ways people do their jobs uh, in and around the NFL. You know, we were talking on the phone yesterday, you're all over the place, you know, doing interviews with one guy on this computer and another guy on your tablet and another guy on your phone, all in these video conferences. So we know the pandemic has definitely affected a lot of careers out there, but how specifically, and you can you give us some examples of, of how it's affected your career? Yeah, and so one of the things that's gone on this year with the NFL is that, well, in, in terms of covering games, a couple things that really kind of define what's going on. And you know, we've had many games this year in the league without fans even in the stands. Now, they're starting to come back and they're starting to come back in small increments. But what they've done in terms of the media throughout the season, A, they've limited the amount of media that get credentials to cover the game. And so there's social distancing in the press box. So say there were 200 people in a press box at a given game, say it's a Browns game or a Cowboys game, um, that number is reduced and there may be 40 people in the press box as opposed to say 200. And, and so they've had to be real, the teams have had to be real selective in terms of you know, which media they are um, approving to, to cover uh, the, the games. And then in the press box, there's the social distancing. So the next guy over may be not just six feet away, he may be 20, 25 feet away. And so that's one of the things they've done. But the other thing that's um, even more critical to the, the difference in what has happened in covering the games is that we are not allowed to go into the locker rooms. And that is really a major, major thing because Jake, part of my the value or part of the value for any of us that, that cover this league and, and, and cover teams is to be able to go into the locker room after the game and talk to players and say, Hey, what happened on that play? Were you the, primary receiver on that play or so on and so forth. Now they've always had press conferences too. So the, you know, the star players would go, come to a podium after the coach or, and, and answer questions like that. But the value of being able to go in the locker room is just tremendous as a reporter. And, and that's also how you frankly, you know, develop rapport with yeah. certain players that may end up, you know, really being good sources for you down the road. So that opportunity has been lost this year because all of the press, all of the uh, media availability is done via Zoom or I think the Patriots use WebEx, but by, via the, um, you know, the video conferencing. And so as you alluded to, Jake, the other night I'm in Tampa 
and I'm covering the Saints and the Bucks, and the game's over, and, and both teams have their press conferences via Zoom. And I've had to do this multiple times this season where I've got, you know, one team's press conferences, you know, tapped into my, my iPhone and the other with my laptop. And I'm trying to frantically write notes and I don't want to miss Tom Brady and I don't want to miss, you know, Sean Payton. I don't want to miss Drew Brees or Cam Jordan or, you know, somebody that, you know, is always interesting at the podium. And so that's been quite the juggling act. Um, I think the teams have done a pretty good job, the teams around the league in terms of, um, you know, really just trying to facilitate that. And they've been organized in that, but it's so different than covering a live press conference because for one thing at a live press conference, you can ask a question. And then a lot of times you can ask a follow-up question and so on and so forth. Well, with the Zoom situation, sometimes, you know, it's a lot tighter in terms of the timing. And so um, I think everyone is trying to, to do the best they can right now, but that's the real major fundamental difference um, with covering the media. And even if you watch on television and you see the sideline reporters, be it, you know, Christina Pink or, or Aaron Andrews at Fox or, or whoever's covering the game, they are not on the field, on the sidelines, like they are typically. Lisa Salters, ESPN, Monday Night Football, another example. They are in the stands, a couple of rows up with the field in the background. So the NFL has really tightened up it, its access to the point that it is just taking one precaution after another and trying to, to maintain during this pandemic. I think, you know, it's all about adjusting and, you know, overcoming those obstacles and, you know, you know, kind of everything, there's a blessing that usually comes out of all the, these curses. And now, you know, you're armed with all this information and how to use technology to almost now, you know, can be in two places at one time uh, if you ever need to be, uh, you know, before we dive into, you know, advice that you would give to students, I want to kind of touch on, you know, the other part of your job that really has a special uh, place in our hearts here in Canton, Ohio at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And that's being a, a selector and on the selection committee, uh, picking these gold jackets, the new class. You know, we just enshrined the class of 2020. You know, we're looking forward uh, to the class of 2021. A uh, guy by the name of Peyton Manning might be up for induction th th this coming summer. Um, what is that experience like to you as a writer? Uh, what does it mean to have the honor to be on that committee? And um, can you tell us, you know, some of the stories throughout how'd you get into it um, and what that experience has been like for you? Yeah, no, no, Jake, you said it. It's an honor. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is a tremendous honor and a responsibility and you want to do it right. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's, you know, when they, when they first called me and I've been on this committee, the selection committee for over 20 years. And, and when I first got the call inviting me to be on the committee, I thought it would be a piece of cake. Yeah, it's easy. Who can't vote for, you mentioned Peyton Manning, you know, somebody like that or Bruce Smith or, you know, no, but Joe Montana, you know, no, no brainers for those guys. Right. Um, but the real difficulty and the real challenge becomes when you've got a ballot and you've trying to whittle that down to 15 guys. And yeah, maybe there's um, a slam dunk, if you will, in that group, but the rest of the, the group that you're considering, they can all be hall of famers. And now you've got to cut it down and make decisions. So that's the difficult thing. And then you compare one player from this era versus a player that played in the eighties versus someone who played in the seventies. And so um, that's part of the challenge. But one of the things that, that I know I do, and I'm really sure that most, if not all of the people on the committee will do as well is, you know, we reach out and we put our reporter hats on and we talk to people to give us more insight on various candidates. And that is a tremendous, um, value to, to being able to add credibility to what you're doing as a voter. Um, and so when we get into our Super Bowl meeting every year where we meet in person, because we do these ballots by mail. In fact, the first ballot, well, now it's, it's digitally, yeah. but for years we've done it by mail, but we can also do it um, now electronically. But the first ballot was, is due tomorrow. And I turned mine in a couple of days ago. And so we'll cut down to 25 and then we'll get a list of 
25 and we'll have to cut that down to 15. And then we'll, we'll go from there once we get to the finalists. But um, you know, one of the things that happens when we all get together <clears throat> is that and you know, we have these great discussions in the room as, as we call it, is that you know, people will say, well, hey, I talked to the linebacker who played against this running back twice a year in the same division. And he tells me that this guy was not as good as that guy, or this guy was better than that guy. Or this guy gave us trouble because he was this type of player. And so, um, you know, that adds layers of, of insight to, to trying to, to make these decisions. And so, yeah, it's, it had, like I said, it's been an honor and a privilege to be a part of it. And, um, it, you know, you, you always want to make sure that you're not, not only representing yourself, but you're representing the sport and the people who play the, the players primarily, but also coaches and administrators, you want to be, be sure that you're, you're representing, you know, people to the utmost. Absolutely. And you've seen, you know, the reaction that comes after that is uh, these guys, you know, our president here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, David Baker, knocking on their door and seeing the reaction, you know, the culmination to, you know, one of the greatest moments in all of sports is, you know, finding out you're in the Hall of Fame and, you know, seeing these stories and seeing how the game has impacted so many people, uh, including yourself. Um, you know, we all like to say here at the Hall of Fame, we're unapologetically football. And we know football teaches so many life lessons, like a lot of other things, but we really want to focus on that, uh, on football. And, you know, being involved in the game in, in so many different aspects. What are some of those life lessons you believe the game teaches and how can the, those life lessons help, you know, people become better people outside of the sports um, yeah. from those lessons they learn? Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. And, you know, you, you when you talk about commitment and total dedication to a, a sport, a craft, a career, um, an education, um, you know, sports really in football, in this case, it really just kind of emphasizes that whole idea of being all in to something and being totally dedicated to doing something to the best of your ability. So that's one thing that you get. Another thing that you get from a football environment, like in other sports as well, is teamwork and the ability to, to work with other people. And, you know, sometimes, and I know me personally, sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm better if I can just kind of go off on my own. And, and as a writer, sometimes you are allowed to do that, but a lot of times you have to, you know, work as, it, it, well, all times really, you still have to work within the structure of a team and, and other people who are dependent on you and you're dependent on them. And that's what happens on a football field. The offensive lineman has to block for the quarterback. Otherwise, the, the quarterback can have the greatest arm in the world. But if he's getting clobbered and, and, and dumped on his, you know, on his keister, then there's no way he can get his job done. So teamwork is another thing. Um, you, you know, you can talk about passion as well. And we hear it so often from a lot of the players that, uh, you know, we run across in, in Hall of Fame circles that talk about the love of the game. Well, you can have a passion for a lot of things, and football is one for a lot of people, and even as fans, there's passion. I mean, just look at you know, how rabid some fans can get on game day. So passion is a good thing as long as it's as long as it's classy and as and, and as long as it doesn't get to the point where um, it, it does damage, I think. But in terms of what you're doing as a profession, just like if what you may be doing as a player participating in sports, that passion is fuel. That passion is a love of really being able to, to do something that you enjoy to the point, and I say this about my, my career and have for, for many years, that a lot of times it does not seem like a job because I enjoy, I enjoy writing and I enjoy telling stories. And so that's what I'm passionate about. And just like players may be passionate about football, students may be passionate about something, um, you know, germane to, to what they're pursuing as a career, um, what they're pursuing academically. And I think that's a great thing to have. You know, part of that's part of our, our job here at the Hall of Fame. And part of our mission is, you know, to promote the values. But that the first part, you know, preserve the history. You know, when it comes to uh, us here at the Hall of Fame, first and foremost, we are a museum. And we need to preserve the history of all the people who made the game great. 
players, coaches, administrators, even the writers. And, you know, here at the Hall of Fame, we have so much on display from writers. We have a full archive of, of almost all the written content that's ever been put out about the game. So I'm going to go out to our museum right now. Nathan Martin, the youth and education coordinator, is standing in front of where a lot of that written content is archived. So Nathan, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Yeah, Jake, thanks for sending it out here. And, and like he said, guys, I am outside of the Ralph Wilson Jr. Pro Football Research and Preservation Center. And basically what that is and what that means is this is the spot that we have all of our 2D archives, photos, articles, pictures, and so much more. And actually, I want to make sure I get these stats right. We have over 40 million pages of documents and over 6 million photographs. And this is a really cool place because... Um, it's open to the public. You can schedule an appointment. You can come here. You can meet with our archivist, John Kendall, and you could research any topic related to pro football history. And I'm sure if I went in there and started doing some digging, I'd find some articles and stories from Mr. Bell. Uh, and that kind of has me thinking, and we're going to come with a question to you, Mr. Bell. You know, throughout your career, you've, you've been in the industry for decades. What's that story or, or that project that you had to cover that you think uh, was the most significant or meaningful to you? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, there was a, a, an assistant coach with the Green Bay Packers years ago named Ray Sherman, and he lost his, his son uh, through a tragic accident that involved a gun. And the original um, verdict uh, the, the case was ruled a, a suicide by the authorities. And the family was very distraught about that because they felt in their heart that it was an accident. And they were trying to get the official classification of the loss of life changed to reflect that it was an accident. And they had run into uh, a lot of roadblocks. And so I told the family story. And, uh, you know, really dug into kind of what happened with the case, what they felt happened, where it was in the legal process. And weeks later, the authorities in Green Bay changed the classification to rule that the loss of life was an accident. I took so much pride in that because I thought that what I did made a difference. Now, it all started with the family being willing to tell their story to me, to, to tell their story. And that's part of you know, what you, you try to do as a reporter. Now, you, that doesn't mean that you work for your source, but you wanna be a person that people feel comfortable telling their stories about. And that's you know, everything from something as, as deep as a you know, personal tragedy to you know, what may have happened on the field or or something that's you know more relevant to the game itself, but that's what you do as reporters. You try to build relationships and build rapport with people so that you are able to tell their stories. And but that's one that really comes to mind. There's been a lot of memorable stories. Another one that I'll throw out there quickly is Jerome Bettis. And um, Jerome let me spend an entire day with him the day after a game to write about what the experience is like for a football player the day after the game. Everybody can imagine what it's like on game day when you've got thousands of people cheering for you and, and say you win the game, or even if you lose, the emotion that's attached to playing football and the great plays. But a lot of people don't think about, you know, they, they'll think about their player next Sunday when they play again. And what goes on during the week for these players um, is a tremendous, um, force, if you will. Sometimes it can be re even really difficult physically to go from one week to the next. And so Bettis let me spend a Monday with him after he had a physically, and he was a big bruising physical back. So he was taking a lot of hits and, and dishing out a lot of punishment as well. And that was reflected in the story. And that story idea came actually inadvertently from Bettis's mom. And a few years, maybe three or four years before I spent that day with Jerome, I had worked on another story with him. And I, I was at his house and talking to his parents and um, his, his brother and, 
and just getting a, a profile of him. And his mom told me the story of how she did not want to leave to go home when Bettis was playing in Los Angeles because she saw Bettis all wrapped up in ice and in pain after playing a game and it just hurt her heart. And that, and then she told me, she said, you ought to do a story on that. And so three years later, I called Jerome and I said, hey, remember what your mom said? Should we should do a story? And, and he agreed. And the Steelers were great as well because they gave me some behind the scenes access where I could go into the training room, go into the film room, et cetera, just to kind of capture what it was like. So those are a couple of the stories that I feel really um, good about, if you will. Yeah, it's got to be real special to be able to tell a story like that, you know, whether it's a more personal uh, thing like you mentioned from Green Bay and, and you're trying to make a difference in a family's life or, you know, you're kind of pulling that curtain back for us as fans with the story about, you know, Hall of Fame running back now, Jerome Bettis and, and kind of what he does in his recovery process. Because at the end of the day, you know, we as fans, when we read stories, we, we love that, you know, that behind the scenes, that personal. And, you know, I can speak for myself self working the hall when you get to be around these players and coaches and you realize they're regular people that's really really special and that's something you've done uh, a great job throughout your career you know no, no, thank you Nathan I appreciate that and um, I think as a reporter and, a, and be it a print reporter or a TV reporter or a radio or you know announcer you are really an extension of the fans you know and like you said Mm -hmm. um, everyone can't get behind the scenes, but if you can tell that story about what happens behind the scenes, it does kind of, you know, add a layer of enlightenment. And so um, that's what you try to do. As, as long as you're doing it accurately, <laughs> that's the key. You, yes, you sir. Don't yes, sir. And, and you don't want to misquote someone, put it that way, as a, as a media person. Um, and, and you want to be able to, to, to tell the story in its full, it, it's much with as much full context as you can. Awesome. Well, Jake, I'm going to send it back to you from here in the museum, and you can continue this great conversation you're having with Mr. Bell. So back to you, Jake. All right. I appreciate it, Nathan. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And, you know, we're going to go back to, you know, we got a question here from Facebook, and this is from Joey. And Joey has tuned in, I think, almost every week for this program. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a lengthy, so I'm just going to read it right here from my screen. It says, um, He's uh, He actually has a major in sport management, but is definitely interested in the journalism side of sport. Um, how was your experience in your college and early years working as a student assistant in the sports information office and or for the, the wings as a as a PR aide? Um, and how did that ultimately help you in form of a career in journalism? Um, he's always searching for some of the true values in, in the experience of both sides of the sports world, whether it be the, the business side or the journalism side. Yeah, no, no, that's a great question because there was a time too that I didn't know what, I knew I wanted to work in the sports industry, if you will, even though I'm really in the news industry, okay, covering sports. But there was a time where I didn't know if I was going to end up working in sports information for a university or in PR for a team or a league. I just knew I wanted to be in that arena. But to that end, uh, when I was in college, I did not work at the state news, which is our campus newspaper. They didn't hire me. I applied, I tried, um, and I did end up writing for the Lansing State Journal um, once I ended up graduating from Michigan State. But what I did with the Sports Information Office and in, in working PR for the Red Wings and Olympia Stadium uh, during school breaks was I got a chance to write. So even though I didn't have the opportunity to write for the state news, which there was a lot of competition to be able to do that, um, but it just didn't fall my way, but I still had to find a place to write. And you know, I had um, a, a boss, the, S, the sports information director at Michigan State was a guy named Nick Vista. And he had a staff of students that worked in, in, to run the department basically. And everybody worked on football. That was the big sport, obviously. And everybody worked on basketball. But then he assigned each of the students a sport or two or three that they had to handle the PR for. 
And so I, I had gymnastics, I had track and field, cross country during the fall. And what I had to do as a student assistant was to keep the records. And that's where you talk about the value of accuracy, which is so critical in journalism, but it's also critical in business too. And, and so that's a, a trait that you, you, you have to respect and develop and you know, really pay attention to because you, you've got to be accurate. And so um, the thing that I did in the sports information office was, you know, I was the guy who would um, collect the stats after the, the track meet, for example, and report it to the Associated Press, to the Lansing State Journal, and any other media outlets that may have been interested or we felt needed to to have the results. And so you you make those phone calls. And this is not like today, I'm sure they just put it on the web and it's it's right there. But in that time, back in the late 70s, um, you called physically, you would call the state journal and say, hey, um, here, I've got the results from Michigan State's uh, cross country victory against Illinois. And you gave them the, the times and all the facts. Um, the other thing that we did in that office, we wrote what we call hometown features. And so um, say there's a track guy from Akron, Ohio, Kenny Eaton, uh, we'd write a short story about Kenny Eaton and the fact that he won his, his high hurdles event. And we'd put up a thing and, and uh, update what he's done all season. And then we'd, we'd write a story and send it to his hometown newspaper, the Akron Beacon Journal. And chances are that they would love to get that content and put it in their newspaper. And so that's what we did uh, in a sports information office. But for me, as a young person developing as a journalist, that gave me practice, that gave me reps. And Nick Vista, my boss, and you know, rest his soul, did a wonderful job, not only with me, but with the entire staff of on hands editing. And so before anything was sent out under the banner of Michigan State Sports Information Office, it went through the ringer with Nick. And that really just helped me develop as a writer, the fundamentals, okay? Everything from punctuation and grammar to, to those facts and, and even structure and how you, you put things together. So that was a tremendous experience. And that's what any young person needs to get in, in whatever field that they are, are in. But I can really speak for you know the journalism end of it that you just have to have the opportunity and sometimes you have to force your way into that opportunity to get the chance to write and to practice and to develop and to critique and to seek advice and have mentors and all of these things that are, you know, they sound easy, but, and, they, and they're not terribly hard, but you can't cut corners. You still have to learn how to, to write fundamentally sound, for example. I think it's great. And one thing you mentioned there is like, you know, when you started out, you really didn't have an idea on what exact path you wanted to. You knew sports, you knew that was what you wanted to do, but didn't have that exact path. So let's, let's go back to, to maybe you're a kid in high school or there's kids in high school watching right now that kind of have that same idea. They have a, a general idea on kind of what they want to do, or maybe they even have a, that path set out already. But for somebody that might not know exactly what they want to do, what are some pieces of advice you would give to those, those individuals, those students who are who are trying to find their path in, in the field or whatever field that they're interested in? Yeah, that's a great question, Jake, because number one, you don't want to put too much pressure. It's okay to have a general idea that I might want to do this, I might want to do that. And, and all that tells you is that you can spend some more time exploring and learning more um, about the different career paths. But I think you definitely should be thinking about what you want to pursue while you're in high school so that you could prepare yourself when you go to college to, to begin uh, getting more experience. But one of the greatest things that um, I think you could do as a student, and one of the things that I did when I was a teenager, is that I reached out to professionals. I reached out to um, newspaper writers, uh, the TV anchors um, in particular, and and, and ask if I could pick their brains. And even to the point where I remember spending a day at, the, at uh, Channel 2 in Detroit where I grew up at um, and, and being able just to kind of see what it was like for 
a television anchor to go through his day. And, and again, for me, it all comes down to storytelling. And, you know, there was a, a movie that I saw and you guys won't, wouldn't know it, but some of the, the, your parents might know it, but it's called All the President's Men. And it was about uh, Watergate and the White House and the reporters at the Washington Post who uncovered the story that, a series of stories actually, I mean, that went on for over a year and it ended up, um, you know, costing the president, uh, the presidency. But anyway, it, it was an investigative piece and it, and it turned out to be a significant part of American history. And so they made a movie about it and I was just so um, captivated by, <laughs> by that story and, and just seeing how those reporters worked. And that kind of, and I was probably about 14, maybe, no, maybe even 15 years old. And that really put the, the bug in, in my mind, if you will, that, hey, I, I think I want to try to be a journalist. And, and then you talk about sports. And I knew I wasn't going to make it as a baseball player or a football player like so many kids grow up. But I liked the idea of being in the sports arena. And I had the experience uh, of being around uh, sports at Olympia Stadium, which is no longer exists. But when I grew up, that was where the Detroit Red Wings played. They play at another place now. But, you know, I got my foot in the door and I did all sorts of odd jobs around the stadium, around the team. And it allowed me a perspective to really just see kind of, you know, just you talk about sports management. I saw all the different parts of the sports world, not only the media and the PR that, you know, services the media, but the concessions at the stadium and, you know, the training staff for the teams and, uh, you know, you name it, the, the equipment staffs and the marketing staff. So I learned a lot about kind of how things operated. One more thing I will add that I thought was very important. I didn't really feel it was as important at the time, but as time has gone on and I reflect back, um, I had a job when I was in college at a radio station in Lansing. And the first thing that the news director told me when he brought me in for the interview was like, this is not a sports job. And he knew my interest in sports. He knew I worked at the sports information office, but he was looking for a news reporter. And so I took the job and it was an, a fascinating experience because the, the job entailed all the things that I had no interest in covering. School board meetings, no offense, teachers and administrators, uh, city council meetings, town hall meetings, anything and everything in the community, but no sports, right? Um, and so as a journalist and as a develop, young person developing to be a journalist, I should say, going to the Michigan State Capitol to write about some, you know, funding measure being debated um, <laughs> at the state capitol, I had to write, had to come back and tell a story about that. And so you learn to um, get the information, find the most relevant information, and to tell the, the proper story. And I did that for the better part of a year and it really helped my development. So, um, you know, so if, yeah, you can want to do sports, but I think if anyone wants to, to do sports journalism, they owe it to themselves to spend some time covering the world and covering politics and covering the, the, the crime beat, covering the community beat, covering the education beat, anything um, beyond what you're really wanting to focus on. And the other thing I will add too, you know, I talk about sports journalism because that's what I do. But I, I think one of the, the key things that if you're interested in being a writer or um, a broadcaster, that if you could develop a niche, that I think will, um, will, will, will benefit you. So if, and that niche doesn't have to be sports or football, that's what, what I do. But say you are interested in education Every, with everything from um, how things are administered to how things are taught to what the curriculums are. So if you have an interest in, in education, you can become an education reporter and that can be your beat. And that can, and once you um, develop 
uh, experience and expertise in that area, that can really be something that's great. And I can say the same thing about, say, science and technology. Um, there are so many different areas that someone can specialize in. And, and again, like I said, way outside of sports, but other areas where expertise can really help, you know, enable a person to to develop as a journalist and to, to have added value that can can travel, quite frankly. Absolutely. And I think all of that kind of sums up into, you know, it's all about experience, you know, and with that experience, not only going to find, you know, because I went through the same thing, you know, I love sports. Like, like you said, I wasn't good enough to play in college. So I, I had to retire after high school was over. Uh, but I knew I wanted to be involved in the game. Not only did I not know all the things that were out there that you could be involved in sports, but I wanted to, to immerse myself, not only to find what I wanted to do, but, but to find really what I didn't want to do. And I think that comes with experience. And with experience comes the, this idea of networking and building relationships. You mentioned people that, that you know by name that, that you worked for in college and, and in high school and how they kind of helped set your path up. You know, when I was in school, networking was stressed hugely to me. Now, looking back at it, I definitely wish I would have done it more, uh, to, you know, because that's all it's about. It's about building those relationships and creating that network for. So for somebody who's, you know, about to enter the career field or they're in their college years, um, who have heard this, you know, this, this key term networking, what advice would you have for those, those people who are in the, those shoes and how they build their network? Not only, not just so in numbers, but, but strategically and reaching out to the correct people. I, I think the first thing to know about networking is that it never ends. So if, you know, I've been in the business now for, you know, for 40 years. So th there are people and that I can say, I met them 20 years ago and 25 years ago. And you never know, it, it, and it's a weird thing too, because you wanna network and you wanna to get to know people and you want people to know you. Um, but the worst thing you can do is to try to, um, you know, connect with someone knowing that you want a job or you want them to do this or do that for you. And that doesn't, doesn't work either. So you kind of have to, um, what, whereas sometimes situations do occur where you meet someone and, and quite often it happens a lot of times that you meet someone, they know you, a job comes up and they recommend you or they tell you that this is going on. So you get the information, but you know, the, the idea is to build a circle uh, of people and you're not going to be as close to everybody in your network but I think the thing that you want to do and, and see as a journalist, it's kind of a two pronged thing because there's a, a network of, you know, colleagues and professional people that you work with. But in my role as a journalist, there's a network of sources, there are, you know, players and coaches and GMs and scouts and people that I have to, to deal with on a regular basis. And so I'll talk about it from from that standpoint for a second. Uh, when it comes to the NFL sources, um, you know, I think a lot of times what's, what I've seen happen, done, haven't done it for so long, is I'll meet a player when he's a rookie, and then 10 years later, he's still in the league, and, and we've, we've had all these different exchange, exchanges over the years. But, you know, you, you just, you want to be good with people. I think that's what it all really comes down to, is human relations, and that's be it if you're building a network of sources or if you're building a network of, you know, colleagues in the business. And, and I talk about these NFL players and now I've been at it so long that I've seen guys, you know, now they're coaches. And I remember when they were players or now their kids are playing and I remember their dad and, and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, you, you just, like I said, you really want to treat people with respect and, you know, represent yourself with self-respect and class and humility. And I think those are, you know, the foundational things to, you know, developing a network because it's all about relationships. So one of the things that I'll, I'll do, like every year, whoever wins the Super Bowl, I'll, and even now in the day, day and age of text messaging, I'll write a note to the Super Bowl coach and just thank, you know, congratulate them on, on winning the Super Bowl. And it's, it's pretty amazing because the next time I'll see that coach, 
they may say, you know, that, that was, I only got a, a few letters because most of it has been text messages and so on and so forth. So people remember that. Mm -hmm. So you do things sometimes to stand out, um, you know, from the crowd. And that, and that was one of the things I used to always tell the, the uh, players in the 49ers locker room when I covered the team on a daily basis. It's like, hey, I'm separated from the pack. The pack's over there. I'm trying to deal with you guys here or you here. And, and so I, I think the players in that situation, and I think in general people um, appreciate if you, you bring a, a human element to what you're doing, okay? Absolutely. And, and not just stick a microphone in somebody's <laughs> face. And, and so it, it may take practice or it, it takes being conscious about it and how you are relating to people. But I think that's a, you know, a big thing. And I, I'll add one more thing about the networking when it comes to the career, um, because I don't think I would have um, got the job at USA Today if it was not for a woman named Bobby Bowman. And Bobby Bowman was a woman who spoke at a black journalist um, conference in Dallas one year back in the eighties, right? And, um, and and I met her after the you know I met, I met her after the the, the uh, presentation and we talked and exchanged and you know, I got her phone number and that sort of thing and and that was that and just had a pleasant conversation with her and I think she probably had a you know favorable impression of me or whatever just from the conversation right um, no ulterior motive nothing like that. Well, a couple years later, I'm out looking for a job. And when you're looking for a job, you contact everybody that you know to let them know I'm looking for work. And if you know of anything or can you help me, blah, blah, blah. And I reached out to, I called Bobby Bowman's office and they said, well, Bobby Bowman doesn't work here anymore. She is gone to USA Today as a recruiter. <laughs> you can contact her there. And so lo and behold, you know, here's a woman who I met who was in a different editorial position that she changed jobs. And what I was looking to do was right in her wheelhouse in terms of recruiting. And that led to the one thing after another. But um, it, so it's pretty amazing. Sometimes you can try to network with people and you don't know how things will change in the future. But the idea is to just kind of connect with people and to get to know people. I think I think our special guest from a few weeks ago and the Hall of Fame zone, uh, Jameer Howerton, uh, said it best when he said, "Your network is your net worth." And I think about building that relationships uh, and you know getting that experiences and, and connecting with those individuals, like you said, even the small things, if it's just a text message or a letter or a thank you note, those tend to go such a long way. And you know, speaking of Jameer, Jameer actually sent in a question here on on the Facebook. So he wants to know how important for you. Is it telling the rich stories of all the black college football hall of famers that now have a home, you know, right here in Canton, Ohio as part of the pro football hall of fame. So what has that experience been like for you? And, and how is it, how, why is it important to you to get their stories out there? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the HBCUs, you know, definitely have um, a unique stamp on history and continues to, but when you look at, some of the Hall of Famers, and there's 20 something, almost 30 maybe, uh, Hall of Famers from HBCUs. And that reflects an era where um, the mainstream colleges would, were not, were segregated. And, and, and not all of the guys who went to HBCUs um, were in that, in that category. I'm talking about guys from the 50s who played in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, they couldn't go to, say, in Alabama. But there are other guys later, and Jerry Rice comes to mind, who could have gone to any school and wound up going to an HBCU. And then there are guys that maybe um, didn't have the opportunity and weren't recruited at some of the bigger schools and wound up at HBCUs as well. That's where they got their opportunity. And so I think that it's important, and it's still important to have these institutions because everyone doesn't always fit in a, a, a certain environment. And a lot of times that environment might be a school that has 50,000 students. When I went to Michigan State, 
it had 40, I want to say 41,000, 42,000 students on campus. And that's like a city in itself. And so one of the things that an HBCU offers is a smaller campus. And there are other schools that are not HBCUs that have the same um, appeal in terms of, you know, smaller campuses and, and certain individuals are, are more comfortable and can, can thrive there, get more individual attention. And so um, I think that the key thing is to not um, dismiss or ignore the culture that exists at HBCUs. And for some people that is really, really um, a benefit to going from high school to college and to the next level. As it relates to the uh, football aspects of it, I mean, we, we see that people, if they get an opportunity, if they can excel at an HBCU, and now we're talking about the vice president elect coming from an HBCU. So I, I think um, the, you know, the value of those schools has always been, um, you know, respected and inherent in the African American community. But I, I think now you see others that have stepped out and, and, and made their mark that it's, it's something that um, I think, you know, deserves a lot of recognition on a broader scale as well. But HBCUs were established because primarily because minorities and African-Americans could not go to certain schools. And so they did not have a choice. So that's kind of the history behind it. I know we were super excited to have them here as part of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the, the Black College Football Hall of Fame, and be able to tell those stories. Not only the the about 10% of the Hall of Famers who attended HBCUs, but but all those guys who really, truly, you know, were, were groundbreakers in their own right, you know, making the game and having an impact on the game. You know, I like to say, you know, you know, the game of football, you know, without our Hall of Famers wouldn't be the same. And it goes the same for them. You know, the game of football is it is it is what it is today because of their impact. So you yeah. got time it, here for oh, sorry, I was going to say one, one more thing, Jake. I was going to say it's great that the Black Football Hall of Fame, Black College Football Hall of Fame is in Canton because I think it just really broadens the the scope and the recognition and the exposure to to so many more people that may not be exposed to it. So I think it's a perfect, um, you know, collaboration really between the Pro Football Hall of Fame and the Black College Hall of Fame. So I'm excited to see where that goes. And then having the game every yeah. year yeah. Um, is just another um, opportunity to showcase what's there. And and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm all over that, man. That's, <laughs> that's a great thing. I know we love it. I know you got time here for one more question and then we'll wrap things up. You know, we had a lot of great advice today um, for, for students of all ages, professionals of all ages, but if you could sum everything up into one, you know, statement of what would be that one piece of advice you want everybody tuned in today to kind of pull out and pull away from the program? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's all about character, right? It really is because everything that we talk about in terms of, you know, dealing with uh, establishing a network, working with other people, uh, developing sources, having integrity in how you write your stories or how you tell your stories. It all kind of comes down to the type of person that you are, okay? And yeah, you want to have passion and you want to be dedicated. We want that and we talked about that. But if you could say one thing that I really, really want to make sure that, um, I recognize and I appreciate it's the character and the character that you want to develop in yourself. Now it's easy for us to judge somebody else and, and, and their you know, question, well, why is this person doing this or doing that? But I think when you talk about character, it starts at home and it starts in the mirror and it starts with, okay, who am I? How am I best representing myself? And if I'm doing things in a positive light, if I'm putting out, you know, that positive energy into the universe. So I think that's the one thing that I think we should all just kind of, um, excuse me, draw on and, and really kind of define in ourselves. And that can take you a long way. So be good, be, be a good person. <laughs> that's probably the- Easy as it is, easy as that, right? 
Yeah, just have just have have good character and try to develop good character. None of us are perfect, so we learn from our experiences and we move forward. But we want to, you know, project that that spirit of, of good character and be that good character. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to wrap up this installment of the Pro Football Hall of Fames before the SNAP series. Um, Jared, thank you so much for being a part of the program today. Like I said at the beginning, the game of football truly wouldn't be like it is today without your influence. Uh, the Hall of Fame wouldn't be what it is today. I wouldn't be who I am today sitting here talking to you without your influence that you've had on us here in Canton, Ohio. So thank you so much. Um, you know, before we leave today, just want to leave everybody with some some last minute reminders. Make sure you're following, you're liking, subscribing to everything on our social media channels uh, here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame to see all the great content that we're putting out. Uh, Mr. Bell might be featured in some of those. Uh, just so so make sure you follow, like, subscribe. If you're a podcast listener, which I know everybody's kind of doing today, make sure you subscribe to the Mission Podcast hosted by that of aforementioned Jameer Howerton. He uh, talks a lot uh, about different parts of the game of football. Last podcast he put out surrounding the history of Charles Fullis, Ohio's own, and all the great relationship and the, the trailblazer that he was uh, in the game of professional football. Uh, so make sure you stay in tune to all of those. For our program, our Before the Snap program, next Friday, November 20th, we have Jesse Lovejoy of the San Francisco 49ers who works with their youth and education team as well as their museum team out there in California as part of the program. You know, I said at the beginning, the game of football, it isn't just on Sundays. There's so much that goes into the game to make it truly what it is today. And I, like I said, it would not be what it is today without, without Mr. Bell's influence. So, Jared, thank you so much for being a part of the program today. Uh, thanks for having me, Jake. Uh, an honor and a privilege. So for myself, Nathan, all of our youth and education team, all the way up to our president, David, David Baker here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, thank you so much for being a part of the program today. And for everybody tuning in, we'll see you next week right here on Facebook as a, with the Pro Football Hall of Fame's Before the Snap series. Thank you, everybody.